the science of stress at the Comic Strip Live. My name is Allison. I am Gen Space's community manager. Um, if you haven't been to Gen Space before or know much about it, we are a nonprofit community bio lab located in Brooklyn. We offer um, access to biotechnology and we promote citizen science as well. So we have monthly memberships and classes on the on like intro, the basics to biotech to teach people how to work in a lab. So if you have any types of questions, please feel free to contact me after, after the show or come up and talk. Um, we give tours all the time. Um, so we are so excited to be here tonight with No Science. We have partnered with them before and we're very excited to be at this venue with them. Uh, Rose will probably give you a bit more of an introduction about No Science when, when she comes up to here. Um, I want to say thank you to our partner, The Comic Strip Live. This is an awesome venue. Um, th so thank you so much for hosting us. They have also graciously given us all um, free entrance to the comedy show afterward, so please stay. That starts at 8.30, at so please stay and drink and just have a wonderful time. Um, so before we get started, I do have to say that when I heard that we have this opportunity to do an event at Comic Strip Live, I was like, yes, like finally people will know how funny scientists are because we are so funny and no one, no one believes it at all. I don't really understand. Um, so I asked some of my wonderful colleagues, just brilliant minds, to give me a few good science jokes. And they gave me um, a few of these gems. So two chemists go into a bar. The, the, the first one says, I think I'll have an H2O. The second one says, I think I'll have an H2O too. And he died. <laughs> oh my god, people are actually laughing at this. Okay, that's amazing. Um, so if, if that wasn't good enough, I also asked for some pickup lines because you always need more of those. So I asked our sweet lab manager for some and um, he gave me, hey babe, I wish I were DNA helicase so I could unzip your jeans. <laughs> and he also said, I wish I was Adney and then I could get paired with you. Um, so that's sweet, but the look on my face was not so sweet, and he was like, what? That would totally work on me. Um, so he, he's obviously working in a, li in a limited dating pool. Um, he needs to raise the standards. I don't know. Maybe not. So anyway, to, to get to what we are here for, for tonight, I would love to introduce our speaker for the evening, Dr. Rosemary Perry. Dr. Perry is a, deve is a developmental... Ooh is a developmental psych psychobiologist, would be so nice if I could say her title, at, at New York University and vice president of No Science. Rosemary holds a BS from the University of Delaware in neuroscience and a PhD from New, from New York University School of Medicine in physiology and neuroscience. As a PhD student, she worked in the lab of Dr. Regina Sullivan, studying how exposure to pain and early life stresses, particular particularly from an, an abusive caregiver, impacts the developing brain and behavior throughout the lifespan. She's currently working as a postdoctoral research fellow in the NYU Neuroscience and, and Education Lab, where her research explores how poverty affects child development. So let's welcome Dr. Rosemary Perry. <laughs> Wonderful introduction. Thank you all for coming tonight to Full House. Let's see how stressed I get talking about the science of stress. Um, so yes, I am Vice President of No Science. How many of you have been to a No Science event before? Raise your hand. Okay, good. Um, so we are a not-for-profit education and advocacy organization. We do lots of free events like this throughout the New York City region. Um, and we, our mission is really to share science with the public. We're very passionate about science. We think that we should educate the public on it. Um, your tax dollars pay for the science that we're doing. And we just think increasing the communication is better for everyone involved. Um, and today, I'm going to talk to you about the science of stress. Not only how stress impacts how we feel on a day to day, but how our brains and how our bodies operate, making it more than a feeling. Um. <laughs> okay. Will be really quiet. <laughs> we told you that there would be really lame jokes at this event. 
Um, okay. <laughs> How many of you have experienced stress before? Raise your hand if you've experienced stress. Everybody. Okay, good. All right, so can you tell me what it is? What is stress? Shout it out. Don't be shy. Interesting. So you've experienced it, but you don't know what it is. Ashley? Uh, Bella? <laughs> a response to a threat. A response to a threat? Yeah. That's good. That's good. Does anyone have any ideas other than that of what stress is? Push to do something you don't want to do. Push to do something you don't want to do. Yeah? Overwhelming experience. Overwhelming experience. Yes. Okay. Those are all pretty good definitions. Um, but let's look at what the dictionary has to say, because I'm a stress researcher, I need to measure stress, so I want to make sure I fully understand what it is before I conduct any experiments. So when I looked up Merriam-Webster dictionary, which is obviously what every scientist does when they're conducting an experiment, um, they brought up three simple definitions. The first one being a state of mental tension and worry caused by problems in your life, work, etc. So I think some of you kind of got at that, that it's overwhelming feeling. The second definition is something that causes strong feelings of worry or anxiety. All right, so now this is a little confusing because the first definition says it's a feeling, and the second definition says it's the cause of the feeling. So the dictionary says stress is the cause and the result of itself, and I don't know if I can wrap my brain around that, but okay. Um, and the third definition is physical force or pressure. So this is more like a physics definition, which isn't really what we're talking about today. So I feel a little more confused, honestly, about what stress is after looking in the dictionary. So I'm now going to do what every good scientist does and check Urban Dictionary because <laughs> they tell it like it is. So Urban Dictionary says that stress is the confusion caused when one's mind overrides the body's natural desire to choke the living shit out of something <laughs> that desperately needs it. So I think that my job just got way more exciting if this is what I get to study. Um, but yeah, I don't know if any IRB would approve that protocol. So, <laughs> as you can see, stress is a pretty am ambiguous term. So why is it so hard to define? That's because our brain is the master controller of what we perceive to be stress or to perceive to be a threat, but it's also the master controller of the behavioral and physiological responses that we have. So the word stress is really tied up in this cause-effect cycle so Merriam-Webster Dictionary was actually pretty on point that we can use it to describe the cause and the effect. But where did this term even come from? If we go back to 1936, we have the father of stress, Hans Selye, and he coined the term stress. He actually borrowed it from physics, which it was used, like the third definition from Merriam-Webster, to define physical force or strain on an object. He applied it to organisms, and he redefined it as the response of the body to any demand for change. And that was helpful to science because he limited the definition to being specifically the response. So the, the overwhelming feeling, the response, is what he's calling stress. He coined a new term for us, which also was helpful, called stressors. And stressors are the cause of stress, so something external in your environment that causes stress. It could be too much work, lack of sleep. Those are examples of stressors. So I'm telling you all of this because these are the terms, terms that I'm going to be using throughout the presentation. When I say stressor, I'm talking about something that causes the feeling. When I say stress, that is the feeling that we've all raised our hands, said that we felt. Um, I'll talk about it as stress or stress response. So luckily for me, I get to benefit from people like Hans Solia and other pioneers in the field of stress. Um, who have worked out that when we have this overwhelming feeling, our body produces stress hormones, which are chemicals that we can actually measure. So this gives scientists a tool to measure something pretty discreet that tells us how stressed out the individual is. So the primary stress hormone is called cortisol, and it is produced by something called the HPA axis. So if you've heard of this before, the H stands for hypothalamus, the P for pituitary gland, and A for adrenal cortex. And this is um, an axis that goes from the brain to the kidney. So the hypothalamus is a primitive brain area that's um, pretty low in the, deep in the center of our brain. And what happens is it triggers 
the stress response. We have a chemical that's released that travels to the anterior, anterior pituitary gland, which then triggers another chemical, which goes throughout our bloodstream until it reaches our kidneys. So it actually leaves the brain, goes to the adrenal cortex, which is the top part of our kidneys. And this is where cortisol is produced. And cortisol is then released and allowed to travel all throughout our body. So when we feel stress, it often feels overwhelming and throughout our body. That's because that's what's happening. Cortisol is being released throughout your body. In addition to that, though, in addition to the HPA axis, we also have something called an autonomic nervous system. And the sympathetic branch of that also contributes to the feeling of stress. And it's complementary to the HPA axis, and it's pretty similar. Basically, our brain fires signals. This time, rather than being molecules that travel, it's electrical activity that travels down nerves to our body and ultimately also ends in the kidney, in the adrenal medulla, so the center of the kidney. And this is where additional stress hormones are made. Um, norepinephrine and epinephrine, which you might have heard of these referred to as adrenaline or noradrenaline. They're the same thing. So together, cortisol, norepinephrine, and epinephrine are the main chemicals that circulate throughout our body that contribute to that feeling of stress. And these are great tools for scientists because we can measure how much of these exist. Um, for example, cortisol, you can measure that in your blood, but you can also measure from saliva, from urine, from hair even now people are measuring cortisol. So it's a really useful tool for scientists. So you may have heard of some of these terms before in a bio class or in college um, because they relate to the fight or flight system. Um, and if you haven't heard of the terms, I'm sure you're at least familiar with the behavioral response of fight or flight when you perceive a threat and your body mobilizes to action to escape the threat. Um, your homework for tonight, I know you probably came here trying to have fun, but you get homework. If you haven't searched the internet for cats being afraid of cute, cats being scared by cucumbers, do that tonight. It's a really amazing series online. I highly encourage you to waste some time looking at that. But it really highlights what the body is doing in response to threats. This cat's HPA axis and autonomic nervous system is going crazy and making it jump because it looks kind of like a snake. That's probably why. But um, Right, so why am I telling you about fight or flight? So stress gets a pretty bad rap most of the time. It has a negative connotation. But first and foremost, stress is adaptive. It is a good thing. It enables response to environmental changes. So this is adaptive many times <laughs> if it is going to enhance survival for obvious reasons. But it's also adaptive for some less obvious reasons. Um, did you know that stress can enhance your immune system? So your immune system is our body's way of fighting off infection, disease, or helping wounds heal. And we have lots of different cells in our body, different molecules that are responsible for fighting this off. And when cortisol is present, it mobilizes the stress hormones, or it mo normalize, mobilizes the immune hormones to be ready to fight off infection and disease. Stress can also improve memory, and this makes sense when you think about it evolutionarily and just for survival, that if you encounter a dangerous situation, you really want to learn to form a memory about the context of that situation, for example, so that you avoid it in the future. Stress can also um, improve cognitive performance. So if I was up here and I didn't have a little bit of stress, I would probably be really boring to you right now. I'd probably be stumbling over way more of my words, forgetting what slide I'm on. Um, I'm a little stressed, so I have uh, attention, I'm alert, and hopefully, I don't think I'm rocking it, but I'll try to do that. Um, if I were too stressed, I might start freaking out, and that might happen before the end of this presentation. We'll see, I'll leave you on the edge about that, and hopefully I don't crash and burn. But the point of this is stress, in acute amounts, so not too much stress, is good, it's adaptive. But when you start having too much stress, that's when we see that there can be some negative effects. So it's pretty amazing to me, I don't know if I'm just a massive nerd, but it's amazing to me that stress can actually impact your cognitive performance and your memory, that's amazing. So many researchers are trying to figure out how that works, how we can do that. And one fairly recent study is showing that Stress can actually alter the structure of your brain, and that's underlying this phenomenon. So this was this whoops, this study was done in rodents, so in animal models, 
And what happened with these rats is they were exposed to a little bit of stress. And then the researchers looked at the brains of those um, rodents, and they looked at their cognitive and mental performance. And basically, adult rats and humans, we are always creating new brain cells in some parts of our brain and incorporating them into our brain. This process is called neurogenesis. And this is healthy and good for development. So what they saw was that with optimal stress challenge, so acute amounts of stress, these rats had increased birth of new brain cells, and this correlated with increased performance on a cognitive task. However, if the rodents were exposed to high levels of stress, their brains stopped producing these new brain cells, and this led to a decrease in performance. So this is just one example of how stress can actually change the structure of your brain, which is pretty crazy when you think about it. So this brings up the discussion of, although in short term, stress can be beneficial, if you have stress over a long period of time or chronic stress where you have repeated exposure, then it can be bad and there, it comes at a cost. And this means that you have an overproduction of stress hormones. So for example, your HPA axis might continue to fire and you have way too much cortisol raging through your body. Um, also the HPA axis or the autonomic nervous system might not be able to shut off appropriately. So if the threat is no longer there and you're still responding as if there's a threat, this is bad too. And our body is designed to help have this not happen when it's healthy and functioning. So the HPA axis actually has a negative feedback loop. So when cortisol is released, it goes throughout the body and ultimately it'll end up in the hypothalamus, which is where it's all initiated to begin with. And it tells the hypothalamus, okay, we have court in the body, the body's handling the stressor, we're reacting to it, you can shut down now, we got this. But sometimes chronic stress can interfere with this process. So the system loses its ability to shut off. And this leads to really high levels of cortisol in the body. And this is really damaging. I could stand up here and give a really depressing talk for hours about how horrible stress is throughout the body for many, many reasons. Um, it affects hair, it affects your heart, it can uh, lead to plaques building up in your coronary arteries, contributing to heart disease, stroke, um, it affects your digestive system. Really, every part of your body is affected by stress, for better or worse. When too much stress, it's for worse. So the main point I want you to take away from this is that stress is more than a feeling. It influences us on a cellular level. So our bodies are made of trillions of cells, billions of cells, and they're all alive. They're, they all have jobs to do, they're living things, and the stress hormones and act, the activity of stress hormones impact their ability to do their job and can disrupt our health and well-being. To give you some examples of this, the phrase worried sick actually has some truth to it, scientifically. Our immune system, that system that we need to fight off disease and to deal with wounds and injury are actually regulated by stress hormones. So with chronic stress, what happens is, although I told you already when you have acute stress, the immune cells are ready to fight, they're ready to go. What happens is when the stress doesn't go away, they get sick of showing up to fight and they ultimately stop showing up to fight, at least most of them do. And we are not good at fighting off different diseases and this is linked to why we see so often chronic stress leading to terrible diseases like cancer and diabetes and others. So I know this just got kind of depressing, but um, <laughs> stress can literally kill you if you don't manage it properly. Um, if you let it go unchecked, your immune system can fail you and you could get a terminal disease. But I will tell you, <laughs> the good news is stress and the stress systems that I described to you are in our control much more than other systems in our body. And at the end of the talk, I'm gonna to talk to you more about what we can do to manage stress effectively so that none of us here die of stress. So chronic stress can also impact the brain beyond just decreased neurogenesis, the decrease of new brain cells proliferating and being added into our brain. What can happen also is that high levels of stress can damage the existing brain structures. So on the right, or on the left, on your left, sorry. On the left, we have a normal brain, not too stressed out, and these are cells, 
And the little branches are their arms called dendrites, and they use this to communicate with other cells. What happens when there's too much stress is these arms atrophy, they go away. And this decreases communication between your brain cells on a local level, but also from one brain region to another. And different parts of our brain are more vulnerable to stress than others. I'm gonna talk about three of those today briefly. The first is the amygdala. This is a little almond-shaped structure deep within our brain. It's a primitive um, area. It's often associated with fear, with a fear response. It helps turn on the stress reaction. It helps trigger the HPA and the autonomic nervous system. And it's very vulnerable to stress. So is the hippocampus, another primitive brain region that's deep within our brain. But unlike the, hippoc the amygdala, the hippocampus helps shut off the amygdala and helps shut off the stress response. So does the prefrontal cortex. This is the front of our head, front of our brain, and this is a higher evolved area of our brain, and this too helps shut down the stress response. So as you can imagine, communication between these brain regions, particularly between the PFC and the hippocampus with the amygdala, is needed to regulate stress effectively. So when you look at a brain like this, where the connections are disappearing, what happens is communication disappears to the amygdala. And that just makes the matters worse. It's just harder and harder to learn how to regulate when you don't have the physical connections that you need. But a lot of stress management therapy is actually treating this. Um, we actually have a no science talk on mindfulness meditation. It's really awesome. And a lot of the findings, the well done scientific studies on the effects of mindfulness meditation are showing that it's increasing the connection of the prefrontal cortex with the primitive limbic system, and that helps protect us against stressors and helps us deal with stress better. Um, I encourage you to look out for that event. I think we'll have that in December of this year. And the last, the last depressing thing I'm gonna talk about today is that stress also has differences in how it impacts an individual based on how old you are. And we have a lot of knowledge, a lot of studies have been done to show that stress in early life produces the worst effects, the most enduring, pronounced effects. Um, I could talk about this for a while too, but I'm just gonna highlight one example. Um, a large study that's been following children who were reared in orphanages in Romania. So in the 1980s and the 1990s in Romania, the government outlawed contraception, they outlawed abortions, and they mandated that all women have at least five children, which is really crazy. Um, and this led to there being a lot of children abandoned places because people just couldn't even afford to take care of the children that they were government mandated them to have. Um, so the orphanages were quickly over full and there weren't enough adult caretakers for these infants. So the infants were being fed and clothed and bathed, but they didn't get to form a strong attachment with the caregiver as a child should when they're born with their parents. Um, so this study has been tracking these individuals for many years now. And sadly, this early life stress, this, this neglect that they received in early life led to a greater risk for having a lower IQ, a greater risk for delayed development. So they hit developmental milestones like walking and talking much later than a child raised with a sensitive parent would and they have more mental and physical health problems. So, really sad. And, oops. Even my computer got depressed. <laughs> it's really stressed. Okay, so yeah, more depressing things. Um, so, this, the effects of this neglect are so severe that it didn't just impact behavior. Here's an example of how it impacted the brain. So here's a brain of a healthy child raised with a sensitive parent. It looks normal, it looks good. This is a child that was raised with extreme neglect and you can see that the brain just really failed to thrive and form the connections and the growth that a healthy child should. And there's a lot that still needs to be done to understand why stress in this early life leads to these terrible enduring outcomes. But one main theme that's coming out throughout the literature is that stress in early life has lifelong, lifelong programming of the HPA access. So exposure to high levels of stress in early life seems to permanently alter 
how the HPA axis, which is where we get our primary stress hormone from, um, behaves throughout development. And in some instances, this means individuals have hyperactive HPA, so they're constantly just producing too much cortisol, too much stress response. But in other cases, and this makes it confusing and harder for scientists to really understand what's going on, we see the opposite. Individuals who have experienced early life stress have very blunted response, very low um, cortisol release in a situation where normally you would expect there to be a cortisol release. Um, right, so we'll talk about the optimistic stuff now. <laughs> so the good news is we have a lot of control over our HPA axis and over our autonomic nervous system response to stress. This is something that we can work on easily by altering our behavior on the day-to-day. -day. And we can beat stress, and we can build up resilience to stress. And this list is in no way even close to being exhaustive. These are just some examples. The first way, it's really obvious, eliminate the stressor. Sounds obvious. But a lot of times, you know, we're human, we'll worry, we'll get anxious, but the best thing to do is actively face the stressor and remove it if you can. That being said, there's a lot of stressors that we face that we can't control. So we need to use other tools in those situations, such as regular moderate exercise, ensuring that we get good regular sleep, having a positive outlook, um, practicing gratitude. I know gratitude journaling is trending right now, and I, I get really happy when I see that. This is kind of a way of cognitive reframing, um, dealing with a stressor. And it's been shown scientifically to all of these methods have been shown to decrease cortisol and increase regulation of the agent. So it's actually changing how your brain and your body are responding to stress. Mindfulness meditation, which I already talked about. Social support, 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 which I already talked about. So, social support. I told you this was my favorite example, so I'm going to talk a little bit more about it. When we study stress response in, with humans in a laboratory, one popular test that is used is the Trier Social Stress Test. And that test is a lot like what I'm doing right now. You have to give a presentation in front of an audience. Luckily for me, you guys are nice and smiling and cool. But in this test, the, the audience is a panel of scientists. They're wearing white lab coats, they have stern faces, they don't speak much, they're very scary. Um, and this has been shown to pretty reliably activate the stress response, get cortisol pumping. So yes, we do this in the lab <laughs> to individuals to study their stress response. And with one study, uh, this is a really cool study, before the Trier social stress test, the participants had to read a letter from a friend. And half the participants, the letter from their friend was a really exciting letter of them outlining their route to work every day. That's literally all, the, <laughs> all that the letter was. This is how I get to work. Um, the second group, the letter was a supportive letter. And they read these letters and then immediately had to go and give this presentation to the Scary Scientist panel. And what they found was that the group that read the supportive letter had really significant reduction of cortisol response um, to this test. So this is really amazing. Their friends weren't even there. There was no like hugging or physical contact. They just read a letter that contained supportive words from a friend, and it made them resilient to the stressor. They had a significantly reduced stress response. So I'm sure all of you here have friends and family. You can control their bodies. You can control your friends and family's bodies. You have a superpower, and I encourage you all to use that for good. This is true also from parent to infant. Infants are not very good at regulating themselves. Their prefrontal cortex is not fully developed yet. They need parents to help them regulate, and parents are excellent regulators when they are sensitive parents. So whenever an infant's getting a painful procedure or experiencing a stressful thing, parents can reduce the stress response and in some instances completely block the stress response in infants. And lastly, there is some truth to the cliche, laughter is the best medicine. Laughter has scientifically been shown to reduce stress hormones. It reduces blood pressure, reduces physical tension and pain. It too can improve immune function. 
and release endorphins, those chemicals that make you feel good in your brain. And it also has social benefits. So when you laugh, you connect with someone, and that taps into the social support system that I just described as well. And most importantly, it's a really good ab workout. So if you don't like exercise, you come to a comedy club. And I'm gonna leave you with one more brief discussion on the stigma surrounding mental health care. So sometimes stress gets out of hand and we can't deal with it. Exercise, good sleep is not enough. And that's okay, that's part of life. I'm pretty sure that happens to everyone at some point in their life. And it makes me sad when I still hear and see people kind of having a stigma around mental health care or seeking professional help to deal with the stressors in their lives. This shouldn't be the case, this should be applauded. And I hope that I've illustrated through this talk that if anything, your mental health is your physical health. If you're mentally not doing well, it can completely impact the way your body functions. It can make you sick. So we need to be prioritizing our mental health on the same level as our physical health. Um, so yeah, just keep that in mind. And with that, I leave you with, do you have any questions for me about stress? So she asked if it's bad that your parent came with the parent. Um, this is something that I worked on in my PhD research, and it's a still developing field. What seems to be coming out of it is when it's not frequent, so if your child is healthy, for example, and you're just taking them for vaccinations that happen every few months or a year, it's not bad. It's good. It's good to block the stress response and the pain response in the infant. What happens? when the child is, needs multiple painful procedures all the time, the repeated pairing of the attachment figure with pain is damaging to the attachment figure. Um, and we are exploring alternatives to that. It looks like presenting the, the child to the parent immediately after the pain is one way to get around it because the, child, the parent can still buffer the stress response without being temporarily paired with the pain. Yeah, that's a really good question. Anyone else? Is there any studies, any other studies on um, the impact of interventions of young children who have um, had of stress? Yes. Um, I can give one example related to the orphanage study that I highlighted. So there are a subset of that population that are doing really well today. Those children developed and were good. And those children were placed in before the age of three into homes. They were adopted and they were with incredibly loving and supportive homes and they were able to overcome a lot of the impact of the early life stress and people are seeing especially in the hippocampus that there seems to be changes the hippocampus is very vulnerable to stress and will shrink if there's a lot of stress and what happened to these children who were in extra supportive extra loving sensitive homes is their hippocampus regained a normal size and that mediated um, return of normal pretty normal behavior as well um, yeah, I give a talk on Valentine's Day every year on the science of love, and we like to highlight how love can repair the effects of early life stress. It really can. And are those are kids who they already sort of be either behaviorally or some other way shown um, the impacts of stress, or was it just sort of random sampling from the orphanage? Which which kids were better? Yeah, it, they, it it correlated very strongly with the parenting style. So the parenting style that was the most loving and supportive produced the best recovery. Yeah. You're welcome. Yes. In your presentation, you mentioned that long term stress can lead to diseases like cancer. Mm -hmm. Like, how does that link work between stress and cancer? That's a question that many researchers are actively exploring. We don't fully understand it yet, um, and it's complicated because, yeah, so 
yeah, I, don't, I won't even attempt to answer that question because it's not my area of expertise. Yes? Hi, what about pharmacological intervention for stress? Pharmacological intervention for chronic stress? Yeah. Um, Have you looked into that at all? Yeah, it depends on, it's, it's complicated as well because it depends on the age that you're trying to treat. So if you're pharmacologically trying to treat the effects of early life stress, um, a lot of work is indicating that serotonin system, the interaction with the HPA axis, that that seems to help repair in animal models a lot of the effects of early life stress. Um, and in adults, even antidepressants alter HPA axis. So I think that a lot of the current medications available, the, that, the way that they're acting a lot is altering the HPA axis, and that's something that's underexplored. But it does seem like the link between serotonergic system and court seems to be a really big target. But it's also not fair for me to reduce it because it's much more <laughs> complex than that. That's just one area of research that is shown in promise, and I'm sure there's additional areas. Um, yeah. How about beta blockers for uh, stress? Well, I know that in adults that that is helpful, but that's more for acute stress, to my knowledge. I don't know for chronic stress treatment. So have, have they done any research into like you know certain events that are, are that cause acute stress? Um, people can walk away just fine from it, and you even said it could be beneficial. Mm -hmm. but, but what about like acute stress that causes PTSD? Yeah, um, so that seems to be linked more to the severity of the initial stressor and how strong the, the memory is of the stress. So with PTSD. Um, current treatment is trying to basically undo a memory because the stressor is so strong and so severe it forms a really persistent memory which leads to the stress response being activated by something that's not even the initial stressor. Is, is it something to do with how powerful the, the, even the biochemical reaction is in yeah. the body? Um, yeah, because the stressor itself is just so traumatic that it leads to PTSD. So even though it was a one-time occurrence, it was a particularly traumatic stressor, you can have these enduring effects. Yes? Um, with anxiety, anxiety goes along with stress. It right? does, yes. Now, when you're being treated with anxiety, and you're being treated with different medication to deal with your anxiety, um, the medications that they're using, are they, are they replacing the damage that's already done, or is it just like covering it up? It's a really good question. I would like to say that it's covering it up in many instances. Um, that is something that we need to study more because I do think it depends on the duration that you're taking the medication, for sure. Um, obviously, when you are altering the way your brain fires and acts, which is what medication can do, it does lead to changes in the way your brain functions. Whether it's fully restoring something, it depends on the medication. It's something that's not really studied well enough right now. But in many cases, it is kind of masking a symptom, um, dealing with the chemical output and not dealing with the initial cause of why the chemical output is different to begin with. Yes. One thing I was thinking about during your talk was the uh, gut brain access yeah. dimension of this and mm -hmm. how stress also potentially has an impact on the microbiome. Yeah. What can you share now? Oh, I mean, it's a very, very, um, new field that people are actively looking at. I believe that stress definitely affects the microbiome. I currently am not involved with any studies using the microbiome. I hope to be eventually. Um, but I think the HPA axis like really highlights how the stress response is a full body thing and the idea that the gut and the brain are communicating via court and can alter the microbiome. For sure, I believe it. There's just not it's a, it's a pretty new field, honestly, so we don't know too much about it. Yeah. Um, in one of the slides, you showed a comparison of the connections that are formed in the brain at, in a, you know, two, two examples. Um, I'm just wondering, so what, uh, what tool or device is used to sort of generate that? you know, kind of uh, image or, or uh, you know, uh, scan. And then second, um, uh, are you, maybe you covered this and I forgot, but are, do you see evidence of those connections in, you know, sort of 
growing or, or improving in adults who follow the techniques for um, you know, reducing and managing stress? Yeah, so that's a good question. There's a number of different scientific techniques you can use to that involve microscopy to view those types of slides. Um, normally, you have to inject the animal or the tissue with fluorescence or something that allows you to pick it up when you look in the microscope then. Um, there are some new stuff, new techniques that I'm not super familiar with that are really cool that are allowing visualization of the brain in awake behaving animals at that level. Um, and I'm looking forward to seeing how people use those techniques to see exactly what you're saying. Can we change the way that the dendrites are growing or retracting based on the experience? Because right now, we can look at it, but you have you can't look at it in the same animal across time because you have to sacrifice the animal to get the tissue. Um, oh, those stands are those. That are was from a from, from dead, yeah uh, yeah because we don't do that in humans. That kind of goes back to my initial question. What the premise was? Yeah yeah. You exactly. do it on live people. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, we, we could do post-mortem analyses, but that's not you know, a very controlled experiment. So you look at post-mortem tissue and can see, and then you can link it to, does this person have a history of early life stress? But it's not a controlled situation. Um, are there any studies about the effect of like mices on stress, right? So say like, you want to relax and say you want to take a candy crush for like, a week straight, right? Now, is that neutral or negative or positive? To play Candy Crush for yeah. me straight. No, I know it's more well, practice. In what's in what's practice. your outcome measure? How stressful are you? Yeah, exactly. I mean, After your, your stress might temporarily go down, but if you've avoided all these other things, then they'll become stressors and you'll be really stressed right. afterwards. So it's all, it's all dependent. You know, there's not like, you could just, I don't know, that's getting out like move to an island and do nothing like so. You could do that and have right. no stress, but it's just about managing your stress. But, also managing your responsibilities well, based yeah. on the lifestyle that you choose. <laughs> no, I'm wondering, like, is there like a, is there like a, a feedback loop for you where if you um, do the thing that relaxes you, you might get that and go back to things that like that energizes you to go back to go back to things that you uh, should be doing in the first place. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely evidence that stress reduction leads to greater productivity in the long run. So. For sure, and this is something that like Google has worked out pretty well, and companies are tapping into that when you create within the work environment things that cause joy and decrease stress, that you get more productivity out of your employees. So you're kind of getting at that, I think, a little bit. No? I'm not sure. My own personal okay. experience, you go, you go either way. I think either. Yeah, I mean, stress okay. management is definitely very important to general yeah. productivity. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I think we're going to end it there, actually. Sorry. Thank you so much, Ross. <laughs>